Hello, you're queued up to enter the portal, but I thought I'd say a few words before this episode. In general, when we present science in front of the public, we do it in one of two ways. Either we talk in an incredibly hand-wavy way about very speculative ideas like string theory, or we have a sort of a corpse of previous scientific thought that has been specifically arranged for public viewing. It's not really science the way we do science. It's kind of a denatured version to make sure that we don't lose anybody because the public is famously supposed to be squeamish about anything involving equations, abstractions, or jargon. In this episode, we try to, well, do something different. I'm actually having a conversation with Garrett here. He's updating me on where his thinking has gone with respect to unifying physics. Now, it's very unusual for anyone to try to unify physics, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for Garrett, even though I don't think his theories are going to work. I make no secret of this. I'm not saying anything behind his back. But he is, in some sense, Theodore Roosevelt's man in the arena. He actually is trying to take on the general problem of the cosmos. And even though I don't think he's succeeding, he has my profound admiration for simply suiting up and trying. Most people, in fact, almost everyone I know, does not attempt to do what he is doing. And for that, he has my admiration and respect. Now, with that admiration and respect comes a desire, not to be mean, but to actually push him on his theory, because I don't want to see him wasting his time, and I feel that when you're outside of the university system, there's almost no one who takes your research seriously. So while there is an aspect of tongue-in-cheek with respect to us being each other's arch nemeses, there's actually something quite serious about it. I don't necessarily like the path that he's going down, and I don't know that I really believe that he's going to get anywhere productive. But I do think that he's an inspiration to us all simply for trying in an era where everyone else seems to have given up. I hope you enjoy this episode, and I hope that you understand that it is an experiment. I'm trusting you guys to listen in on something which is much closer to actual science than what you're usually presented with. I hope you like it. Stay tuned. You found the portal. I'm your host, Eric Weinstein, and I'm here today with my arch nemesis, physicist, Garrett Lisi. Garrett, welcome to the portal. Thanks for having me on, Eric. You're a brave man. Well, I would say you're a brave man coming into the lion's den, so thank you for coming by. Uh, for those who don't know who you are or what this issue of uh, being arch nemesis is about, what uh, what could you do to inform our listeners and viewers uh, about who you are and what our relationship might be? All right. Well, we have a, many disturbing similarities in that we uh, did fairly well in school. We got our PhDs, but then we left academia and but maintained an interest in fundamental physics and uh, kept pursuing this on our own. Um, however, uh, there are some distinctions in that you went into the finance world and I went into being a surf bomb. Yes, that's not that yeah. similar. Also, yeah. you are you have a PhD in physics proper, right. whereas I have one in mathematics. Um, so I would say advantage Lisi, but then I have one from a uh, more typically powerhouse school. You have one from one that's a little bit off of that main corridor uh, that maybe got up caught up uh, in string theory and the the fads that propel uh, the field, but. I think what, what's been very interesting to me is that in all of theoretical physics, which everyone is quite interested in, you still find people publishing books on quantum theory and uh, all of the spookiness, weirdness, and beauty that constitutes theoretical physics. Um, it feels to me that almost no one is pursuing actual theories of everything. We talk about theories of everything all the time, but that the courage to actually put forward anything that even remotely resembles the theory of everything. Um, almost nobody's willing to do that. Would you say that that's a fair statement? Yeah, it's a very fair statement. And the, the main reason for that is because it's such a hard problem that you pretty much have to be a megalomaniac just to, to tackle it or to think you have a chance of succeeding at it. Well, I think that's a weird statement. Like if you're doing, if you're going to throw away your life on issues of theoretical physics, what is it that you would imagine people would think that they were doing? Like if you're not going for the brass ring, why enter that field? Well, I think that 
a lot of people in physics are doing the usual thing where they encounter a problem and try to solve it and try to proceed incrementally. And that's how actually I got wrapped up in this is I identified a problem with electrons and their description in, in fundamental physics. It was something about it that really I didn't like. It just didn't, just didn't feel right to me. And I got wrapped up in solving that you know, one aspect of this big picture. I didn't go off trying to think, oh, I'm, I'm really going to tackle this problem of coming up with a theory of everything. Because you, you, you have to be somewhat of a lunatic to, to take that on. It's like, you know, like trying to prove some theorem in mathematics that has been stagnant for hundreds of years. It's just, you know, you're probably not going to succeed and you'd probably just be frustrated with the attempt. You have to have a huge ego to even think about it, right? And also there's a lot of discouragement. Our students are actively discouraged from tackling such problems because the professors who came before them and know a little bit more about the field know just how hard it is to make progress even on small problems and that making progress on a huge one is just insurmountable. So they try to actively discourage their students from, from going into fundamental problems in physics because they, they, they haven't had success themselves. So they're, they're trying to be protective of their students that way. So maybe just to set this up, and I, I should say to regular listeners and viewers of the portal, this is intended to be something of a transitional episode so that the entire podcast is an experiment and you know, other, other people have shows and there's a concept of professionalism. I don't think that's what we're striving for here at the portal. This is really, um, un, untested. We're going to experiment with our advertising models. Uh, we're going to experiment with what the traffic will bear when it comes to, in, uh, intellectual discussions, uh, without spoon feeding everything to the audience realizing that some people may get left behind. In fact, the host may get left behind. We don't know. I hope not. But no, it's quite possible. And um, what we've done is we've done a series of interviews to begin the podcast to just establish that we can have uh, conversations that people want to tune into and get great guests in that chair uh, where people may not have even heard of the person before, but hopefully walk away feeling enriched. However, that's not really the point of the podcast. The point of the podcast is to explore new territory intellectually at it maybe an academic level outside of traditional channels. And it has to do in part with my belief that um, we don't really understand how much uh, idea suppression has been going on for a very long period of time within the standard institutions. In fact, I've I've created this thing I've called the DISC, the Distributed Idea Suppression Complex. And its purpose is to make sure that ideas do not suddenly catch fire and upend and disrupt previous structures. So for example, I would claim that string theory, which has absolutely dominated theoretical physics since what, 1984? Yeah, since about then. So it's about 35 years. Um, it artificially consolidated the field around a complex of ideas that did not have a huge signal coming from experiment, uh, you know, to, to, to try right. to steal home base. Well, I mean, to understand that you have to understand the, as I'm sure you do, the, the culture of particle physics at the time when string theory started to grow, which is, you know, up until, uh, you know, up through the seventies, there had been steady experimental results coming in from particle accelerators, where it was like a new particle every week that theorists were having to, to really you know, cooperate on as a community to jump in on and try to figure it out and exchange ideas very well. That rapidly. was more the 50s and 60s. It was, but yeah. it continued all the way through the 70s. And, and from that culture of you know, community working together on, on information that's coming in a steady stream right? You got this culture of like, yeah, no, don't go do that other thing. It's a waste of time. You really want to be working on what's hot, right? Because there's new information coming in all the time. And this is where the culture of string theory started. I was also more involved in the, in the culture of general relativity and gravity, okay? Which is a very different culture. It's much more slow paced. You don't have new results coming in all the time. Everything's very, is, is much more Do you casual. mind if I set this up a little bit for our audience and you can sure. critique if, if I do a poor job? In essence, the two great idea complexes in fundamental physics, not condensed matter physics or astrophysics, but like whatever ground reality physics is, um, is the general relativistic complex around the ideas of Einstein. And then there's the sort of quantum field theoretic 
complex or the quantum complex around the ideas of Bohr. It's sort of fair enough and Planck. I, mean, I don't mean to slight Dirac and others, but just to keep it simple, the children of Einstein and the children of Bohr. Right. And the, the, the boring people went into particle physics. The boring people? Well, you said they're the children of Bohr. So, uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Okay. So, so they're, so they're in this culture that's a very rapid fire, you know, moving, moving things along as part of a community. Whereas general relativity, the people from the Einstein community were more exploring different possibilities at their own pace. And there is more of an exploratory culture. And that's the culture that turned into loop quantum gravity. So, uh, so first of all, I'm just going to, I'm going to begin arguing with you there to me. Yeah. The issue was is that Einstein put much more of uh, the general relativistic picture in place, so there was less to do for the descendants of Einstein. And because the quantum was considerably less tied up, um, there was much more work. And so through a system of selective pressures, the more successful community in some sense left fewer descendants and they were less capable because there was less for them to do. And then you had the quantum community start to attract the real brains uh, because there was lots of work for a period of time to go back and forth between theory and experiment. That's right. Okay. And, and, but what happened was that uh, when the, when you think about it as a whole, that gravity has to be quantized. So there, there are two ways of getting there. You can either start from uh, Bohr's children and, and quantum field theory and try to get from there to a quantum theory that encompasses gravity, or you can start from the gravitational side and geometry and try to somehow get quantum mechanics to play nice with this essentially classical geometric theory. And there were two very different approaches and two very different cultures. I still have some disagreements, but I don't think I necessarily want to, uh, to derail us. All so, right. all right. So, so anyway, my, my, the, the point I started with was that the, the string theory came out of the particle physics community. Now, when we say string theory, we mean the cultural explosion that happened in 1984, rather than the original string revolution of let's say Veneziana, which was much earlier. Okay. Right. So, so that in, in the, mid 1980s there was a discovery called the anomaly cancellation where two very improbable things uh canceled each other and the theory uh was suddenly there was a theory that was given a green light that was highly restrictive as to what could what could go in that spot yep. and that result the anomaly cancellation gave birth to a cultural phenomena, which was the sort of takeover of theoretical physics by string theory. Right. It, I mean, it looks so promising at the time in the eighties. I mean, they thought that yes, it naturally encompasses gravity and uh, all we need to do is find the right, uh, you know, high dimensional manifold to attach to uh, for our strings to vibrate in and we'll immediately recover all the properties of the particles of the standard model. We just have to find the right one. We'll probably get this done by lunchtime be wrapped up. I don't believe that story. Well, they, it didn't happen. That was no, no, that no. Was but I don't think that's a, even what actually happened. In I, I mean, I was in college in, in, during mm-hmm. this period, and even though that's the story that I would agree is told inside of the community, yeah, I'm not sure that I fully believe it. If I go back to my own memories, something very different happened. Well, it took a while to get everybody on the bandwagon. I think something still different happened. I think that Ed Witten showed up, right, and that right. there was one human he, being. He, he's his own anomaly. He was an. He was absolutely an anomaly. He came to Penn in, I don't know whether it was 83 or 84. Uh, I left in 85. And he started talking about what the world was in a way that none of the physicists could actually follow because he was using ideas from from differential geometry and from higher mathematics in ways that most of the community couldn't track. He was saying things like, the reason we have three copies of uh, the kind of matter that makes up our world comes from the uh, characteristic numbers of a six dimensional complex manifold found at every point in space and time. And these things were so mind blowing. I mean, if if our listeners can't exactly follow it, they were in the same uh, shoes as many people in the community. There was a voice that was clearly coming from another planet. Right. um, 
undoubtedly the most brilliant person I've ever met in my life. The one person who continues to make me tremble when I hear his name or his voice. And this person signed on big time to string theory in a way that was very uh, coercive and seductive. So that even though the, the community understood why he was signing on, it was in part Witten's endorsement that really started to move the needle in my opinion. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's stunning just to what degree that failed. Okay. So say more. Well, the, the string theory unification program, the idea that this description of all fundamental particles and gravity and, and our entire universe would come from a model based on strings vibrating in other higher dimensions. I mean, that this unification program has failed. The, the vast majority of the high energy physics community has been working on it for over 30 years, and they've utterly failed to deliver on that promise, despite the, the high, high hopes and promises. Well, and this has to do, uh, and again, we can sort of do a small synopsis of the field. The idea was the original hopes had been built around an idealized point particle concept where hard little balls uh, were kind of the naive model of particles. And then you had to smear them out uh, and do waves on waves uh, from that point particle concept mm -hmm. called second quantization or quantum field theory. And string theory said, no, the fundamental unit should never have been a hard little ball to begin with. It should have been modeled by something that was an as if string, obviously, and it wasn't string made out of atoms. It was right. some sort of mathematical version of. Right. It's an abstract mathematical description of a, of a surface inside a, another surface, essentially. Right. And so that this, this thing had a peculiar appeal to the children of Bohr that was not that appealing to the children of Einstein. Would that be a fair description of it? That it yeah, had it's for pretty subtle reasons, specifically anomaly cancellation, and also the ability to produce what appeared to be uh, particle excitations within from the string model. Right. Now, that thing, that sudden shift in the community from regular quantum field theory, from a plurality of different approaches, whether some of them had names like technicolor or grand unification uh, or supersymmetry. All of this seemed to get subsumed in this, um, I don't know, a fad? What, what, it's hard to no, It's like a giant rolling, what, Katamari de Marcy ball, where it's just collecting everything that it touches and making it a part of itself. That's right. It and along. in fact, the claim was, if we find something that isn't string theory, we'll just find some way of including it and call it string theory. That's right. So this was a bizarre, you know, there was, it was a sociological phenomena. It was a, um, we, we would say the political economy of science was involved where we, if, who could get a job for their students, whether or not the newspapers were going to challenge this or go along with it. So you had reporters who had no idea what was going on, publishing these glowing uh, pieces about the string theorists and how they were going to wrap it all up. Yep. And in essence, um, you know, we have this concept in evolutionary theory called interference competition, where one animal will attempt to outcompete the other by keeping it away from like a watering hole. So ah. nobody else could afford to get nourished because the string theorists were saying all the smart people are in string theory. It's the only game in town was yeah. the famous phrase. I, I certainly encountered a lack of nourishment when I graduated in the nineties and I wasn't interested in strings, but I was interested in high energy physics. Well, I think almost everybody was in that position. That, that is really the founding crime uh, for me in the string revolution. It was the desire to say that everyone who is not part of us is an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. That's above and beyond normal physicist arrogance above and beyond normal physicist arrogance. And yeah. I want to say also why I think I'm so focused on theoretical physics as the most important endeavor uh, that humans are engaged with. I think there, there are three components to it and just see whether, whether it resonates with you. One is that this is the closest we get responsibly to asking, why are we here? What is it that we're made of? It, it is the thing that would best substitute for a religion if you were able to understand what it was. The second thing is, is that it appears to be um, the secret powering our economy that very few people have really fully understood. It gave us the World Wide Web, the semiconductor, uh, the electron shells that generated chemistry, nuclear power, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, 
uh, communications technology, electromagnetic, you know, Wi-Fi, what have you. Um, if you want it, and it invented the, the theoretical physics, more or less created molecular biology. That's probably a bit of a stretch, but the, the others certainly aren't. So, yeah. If you look at the RNA tie club, you know, the people in it <laughs> were Teller, Feynman, Crick, people trained in physics. So in, in this telling of the tale, um, its second major feature of importance is that it sort of created our modern economy. And I don't think people have understood the extent to which all of these things from, you know, the web semiconductors, um, and even molecular biology really came out of theoretical physics because of the third issue, which is, I think, even though I'm a mathematician or trained in mathematics, I could make a pretty decent argument that this was the world's most impressive intellectual community ever. It, it certainly it seems to attract some of the greatest minds. Well, I would say I would go even farther. I would say that because of the interplay between the most beautiful mathematics, even according to mathematical standards and experimental discipline. So you have this, this thing that's forcing you to go back and forth between pu the purest of pure theory and the, the dirt and intuition uh, and messiness of experiment. I don't think anything else had that property so that it wasn't necessarily even that it just attracted the best people, but it, it actually rewarded um, human intellectual achievement at, like no other subject ever. Right. It's also touching on something uh, that's a little bit different socially, which is the type of people who are attracted to, to really, you know, hard problems and fundamental physics and, and modeling and really trying to get, as you say, the source code of the universe. Um, these often aren't very skilled people, people. They're, they're not very socially oriented people for the most part. Some are, some aren't. Yeah. But for, for the real intellectual heavy hitters, you're, you're talking about people who sort of, I mean, walk among us as aliens. You're talking about you know, that they're not extremely social. They're not very focused on, on issues with other human beings and physics, this understanding of our universe through mathematics is really a otherworldly pursuit, right? It's not like law where, where laws are made up by humans and discussed in front of humans and competed in front of humans. It's, it's, I mean, that has its own intricacies and difficulties and puzzles, but theoretical physics, you're getting you're working at something that's not related to humans directly. I mean, any intelligent beings in this universe that advance to a certain state are going to be involved in studying physics. And it's going to be the same physics, right? With some of the same mathematics and the same mathematical tools. It's, it's something that exists independent of humanity. So if you're, if you're not a huge fan of human beings and, but you, you really like puzzles and you, you're good at math, Physics is very attractive because it's a it's a it's the greatest puzzle there is in our universe, and it exists completely independent of humanity. And yet humans have been able to work on it and make progress, which is freaking amazing. It's amazing the degree to which humans have have understood our reality, and and I think we're getting close to having a com what yeah. Be considered I would a complete say it's one of the of it. three classes of greatest puzzles. I mean, if I, I could, I could tell a story that biology is the greatest puzzle because, uh, yeah, without, but... without something to care about the universe in which it lives, mm -hmm. uh, this is all completely sterile to begin with. And I can also make a different case for mathematics, which is that physics is but one example of a universe. We don't know if there are other universes that can, could be constructed. So, so, so biology, I mean, it's, it's, I, I agree it's intricate and, and it can be a pure pursuit, but it's not pure in the sense that so much of the foundations of biology are somewhat arbitrary. Like whether a, a you know, DNA helix is going to spiral to the left or the right and, and, and what its chemical components are precisely, that might vary. Other planets, you know, other, other civilizations, biology is going to be different. You okay. could make a decent argument that systems of selective pressures, as described by Darwin and Wallace, there, there will, might be conserved even yeah. if you had didn't have carbon-based life. There will be convergent evolution, of course. Sure. But but the, the details will, will be slightly different. So if you're studying biology, by the time you get up to something like cells or, or, or animals, um, it's going to be wildly different in different different places in the in the galaxy, right? Whereas uh, whereas physics is the same everywhere. 
Okay, it's it's independent of biology, and, and it's independent of humanity. And it's uh, I I think, and then when you go to mathematics, um, mathematics, the pursuit of mathematics, like how things get proved, and how structures get built up through axioms that are then proved. It's a it's a larger playing field than physics. So within that huge arena of possible mathematical structures, okay, we see appear to live in one mathematical structure. So I mean, a physicist only has to focus on the the mathematics that we that describes right. and, reality. And I, by the way, I share your intuition that in a certain sense, this is the best and most interesting place to play, in part um, because there's this very weird feature that we've seemingly unearthed about the physical universe, which is that it unexpectedly has this bizarrely good taste yeah. <laughs> about what to care about within, it's, it's as if you let it loose in the mathematical um, jewelry store and it, it selects only the <laughs> finest pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to wonder if that's, you know, is that just our human take on it? Because our, our human aesthetics have evolved within this beautiful world and universe. So is it that, uh, I mean, Douglas Adams uh, described the anthropic principle as a, as a puddle of water, right? Thinking it's like, wow, this, this, this hole I'm in is just perfectly formed to my shape, right? Isn't it wonderful how it just fits me so perfectly and, it, and, and, it, and it's so comfortable here, it, just like it was made for me. Well, it's like, no, the puddle got there and filled the shape of the, the hole. I mean, the, the water got there and filled that shape. And as humans, we, we ended up here and we filled this niche and our aesthetic taste was shaped by what's around us, including the, the mathematics that underlies the physics of this universe. And so when we look at the universe, you might say, oh no, uh, maybe it's just our taste evolved within this universe. So this is why we find physics aesthetically pleasing. Do you actually believe what you're saying right now? No, I think it's wrong. I mean, but I, I, I think I, but this I is so cowardly. It. I know, I agree, and I, and right? I, like, I, like, I have to wonder about it. I have to, I mean, no, I, I understand. question We have to everything. pay lip service. You know, no, it's not just lip service, I think about this. I mean, I think, I mean, is it really my proclivities have been shaped by my environment in order to think this? Because I have to question everything all the time. Sure. Mostly because I don't talk to enough other people. But, but also it's, it's because, you know, you, you have, when you're questioning things and you're delving with fundamental building blocks, you, you want to make sure as you build things up that you have things right. And in looking at the fundamental pieces of physics, you know, the fundamental mathematical physics, I, I really think that the mathematical pieces, as you say, are the ones that are extraordinarily beautiful. And it's not just my aesthetic taste has been shaped by evolution that causes me to think that. I really think uh, objectively, these are very pretty mathematical objects be underlying our physical reality. Yeah, I think we just lack the courage to say what this appears to be, which is, there is something that we do not understand about the universe in which it is selected for the most mysterious, most beautiful stuff um, with which to write what we, I mean, the closest thing we have to source code. Uh, we don't, we're not at the source code yet. We're not quite at that layer. Right. But, but you can smell it, can't you? Well, I mean, yes and no. It feels close. I think it's almost provably close, but yeah. but the, there's a caveat to that, which is, I think we're almost at the end of this chapter. Hmm. And it does feel like it could easily be the final chapter. Um, and by, by the way, we should be, we should clarify that when we, when we talk about a theory of everything, we don't mean a theory that once understood could explain everything you see in your daily universe. Right. I, we love mean, is still going to be a mystery, of course. Oh God, you really did that? <laughs> of course I did. But yeah, no. Ladies but, I mean, file, but fine, there, <laughs> form a single file line. There's, there's, there's evidence. I mean, there, in, our, in our understanding of physics, as we've learned more particles, yeah. the fundamental particles we've learned about appear to be filling out a complete set. I mean, we've, you know, when you, when you predict that a tau quark should exist, right? Or no, that, that a tau lepton should exist. Or you, you, you figure out that, you know, it completes this set. It's this third generation. It's complete, right? So we, we seem to be completing 
our set of, of fundamental particles. So we have three sets of Lego. Yeah. Right. The first generation, second generation, and third generation of matter, yeah. and all the pieces in each generation are mirrored in the other two generations, just at different mass scales so far. That's what it looks like. Well, it's not just so far. It's like we have, we have reasons to know that there aren't, there aren't more I mean, from, from how the big bang set matter loose in the universe. We know that there aren't more than three generations up to a certain uh, very high energy. Well, we, we've known a lot of things, Garrett, that have turned out to be wrong. Uh, well, but this is really filling out a pretty complete pattern. I don't dispute, but I just, except, except for this minor point of dark matter still being completely unknown for the most part. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess my discomfort with this comes from the fact that knowing the history, I know how we've been wrong. And I also know how we haven't had the courage of our convictions. And one of the things that really, you know, occupies my mind is why we're not more definite about things that I think we have very good, good reason to believe. And we're so definite about things that sort of scare me where we say, I know that it can't be other than this. Um, and yet it has, we've been, we've been shown up multiple times that we've got two different directives telling us to be both more confident and more humble. Right. Um, the thing that has affected both, both you and, and myself most profoundly is the existence of something called spinners at the core of our understanding of matter. Do you want to say a little bit about what that is, why it, you think it's affected you and, and, and me as well, and why it, perhaps it hasn't had the same emotional or intellectual uh, impact on the community? Right. I mean, when you're basically, when physicists uh, more or less completed the, what's called the standard model of particle physics, right? You have, you have the, the known forces in physics, like the electromagnetic force, the weak force and the strong force, as well as the force of gravity. And then you have the, the matter particles, which are electrons and quarks and neutrinos and, and other generations of these that, that form, uh, you know, what, what are called the fermions. Okay. And these are called the matter particles. And they they have mass because of the interaction with the the Higgs boson, right? Which is sort of in between. It's not going to make sense to people. It's not all right. Um, but anyway, um, the the force particles behave differently as elementary particles under rotations than the matter particles. All right. So these matter particles, uh, they you have to basically rotate them seven hundred and twenty degrees to return them to their original state. Right, whereas most objects you rotate it and you rotate it 360 degrees and you get back to where you started. Right, but spinners are different. Right, and they they behave in a very specific way, and there's a, there's a very specific way of describing them mathematically. But it's described in, a, in an unusual way. It's described as a as a column of complex numbers or, or a column matrix, if you like, that's acted on by a rotation matrix that tells you specifically how these particles transform under rotation. Honestly, that wouldn't make any sense to me. And I don't think I can help all of my right. audience to well, get this it. Is the, this is the thing. So, so this is the way physicists are introduced to a description of electrons. Well, look, look, can I just try to, to play with something while, while we're talking about this in this way? Well, I, uh, you can, let me, can I hand it off to you in about 10 seconds? No, you, you t finish all it right. out. All right. So I found this description to be incredibly unsatisfying. All right. Because the rest of physics is not described this way, right? You don't introduce a, a fundamental field that transforms a certain way into rotations. That's not how, you know, why would the universe do that? It's not elegant. It's not, it's not geometric, right? It seems sort of arbitrary. Why would the universe have spinners in it? Well, it turns out that because if you, if you describe general relativity as curving four dimensional space time, describe gravity, and you describe forces as, as, as gauge fields, Right. Both of those are very geometric descriptions. They're very elegant mathematically. And then you describe physics, the, the fermions as spinners. It looks like a kludge. It just, it doesn't fit with the other theories, but that's why I, uh, I left physics to, to solve this problem. I wanted to know why spinners geometrically and no one else was interested in the problem. No one else thought it was a problem. They're like, yeah, they, they transform this way. And, uh, and maybe it comes from strings and that's all you get. And it's like, no, that's totally unsatisfying. If, if gravity is described geometrically and, and our, all our other forces are described geometrically, 
the universe is just one thing. It's right there in the name. I mean, una is one, verse is turning. We have, we have this one turning thing that we call the universe. And it's just one mathematical object. And if this, if we have different particles, they have to be aspects of this one mathematical object. Why would this mathematical object have spinners as an aspect of them? It was a huge mystery to me. I wanted to go solve it. No one else even acknowledged it was a problem. And you, you also tackled this. This also bothered you. Well, there was a, so this is the very difficult part of what the portal is supposed to be. And I, I have the feeling that we've probably left a lot of our listeners behind, but I've, I've said that we're going to have to take some risks and this is going to be one of them. So the way I see it, um, some, some of our listeners are also viewers, right? And we have in studio, um, these beautiful Klein bottles from Acme Klein bottle and Cliff Stoll out of uh, Oakland, I guess. These objects that I'm holding up, um, or you can look up Klein bottles on the on the web, have this very odd property that they are covered, if you will, by the surface of a donut if the surface of the donut wraps around this object twice. And we call this a double cover. Now, the idea that you have some very strange object with no inside and outside called a Klein bottle, but that it's wrapped twice by some object which has different properties, namely the surface of a donut called a torus. The rotations of our three-dimensional space bizarrely have some object that covers them twice, just as a donut covers a Klein bottle twice. So when we talk this crazy language about you have to rotate an object more than 360 degrees for it to come back to itself, this is somewhat of garbage language that we've taught people to understand where we're not really showing them what's behind the curtain. We're not showing them that there are the rotations of a rigid three-dimensional space. And then there's this thing that covers those rotations twice called the spin group. And that spin group is the thing that has the property that it acts on these things called spinners. So this is a hidden level of structure that you would not know was there just from three dimensional space. There's some secret trapped in three dimensional space that is very well hidden. And if we weren't at a very high level of mathematics or physics, you would never know that spinners even exist to play with. Right. I mean, it comes out of representation theory, but that once again, that's a fairly high level of mathematics you have to get to, to even see that these things exist. And yeah. for all of the other basic kinds of symmetries, we don't have these hidden representations. We don't have these hidden spaces that have these bizarre properties. It's only for these things called orthogonal groups. So it's a very special property of real um, Euclidean rigid space that spinners are there to be found. And not only does nature find them, she bases all of matter around the hidden object that can't easily be seen or deduced, which is a total mind job. Right. And the math community has in fact sort of split between people who think, hey, we can describe these things mathematically so our work is done, versus other people who believe there's something about spinners that just, it, it continues to surprise us. We don't understand where they came from. They're a hidden feature of the universe and they keep giving in this very mysterious fashion. Yeah, and the uh, most of the general relativists who came at this problem um, just would not want to touch it because it's too foreign to them. And the people who came into it from the particle physics side Thought it wasn't a problem. It's this, they, they trans, it's this field transforms a certain way. It seems perfectly well described See, to well, me. Eve, that doesn't, this doesn't yeah. make sense to me at all. So it me, didn't make sense to me either, Eric. That's but, why well, let I me, left Let, let me give you an argument as to why this is a real, really serious problem. Huh. If I take two kinds of thing that might, one might hope to find in the universe, an electron and a photon, okay? So the idea is that I've got stuff that orbits around uh, atomic nuclei and I've got light and its relatives uh, that carry uh, the electromagnetic force in the photon. If I don't know how to measure length and angle, I can still talk about the objects that are photons. We call them spin one particles. But if I don't have length and angle, 
I don't have any way of talking about spinners. Right. In other words, if there isn't a ruler and a protractor, which is effectively what Einstein used to define space time, I don't have an ability to talk about spinners. And that's a big problem because if well, you're it's not going just to a problem, it's a huge clue. It says the, that spinners have to be intimately related to gravity and general relativity and gravity. So spinners are over on the quantum side of the equation, right? In the, in the children of Bohr, it's really more their object than the children of Einstein's. The children of Bohr claim we have to quantize gravity and make everything quantum. So it's sort of an imperial um, belief that the people who study the standard model should extend their techniques to cover gravity so that all can be one. Yet, if it turns out that there, we don't know how to measure length and angle between measurements, because in quantum theory, you get something very different when, when, things, when, when a field is propagating versus when it's measured. All of the probabilistic stuff we talk about is happening when there's a quantum measurement. Mm -hmm. If you don't know where length and angle are while something is propagating, then you don't even know where where the electrons can be a disturbance. If, if electrons are waves, they have to be waves in some kind of a C. You know with photons that you can't tell exactly where the wave is, but you know where the C is. In the case of electrons, if you don't know where the, the metric is, you can't even say where the C is that the electron would be a wave in. That's right. And it's a very convoluted thing, but it's a big difference. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I can almost describe it uh, in extremely simple terms, which is most people, most physicists who, who think about it, think of gravitational charge as being mass, but gravitational charge is really spin. Well, you, 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 we're getting pretty, <laughs> we're, we're getting pretty far afield. All right. Um, so to speak, so to speak. Um, so let's imagine that maybe our listeners haven't understood exactly what we're saying, but that there is some special problem about spinners and how, how they're tied to the structure of space time that is different where you can describe things like photons in some sense without knowing how length and angle are measured. Whereas length and angle are essential if you're ever going to talk about spinners. Now you and I have two very different points of view. And the reason that, that I consider you an arch nemesis is that I think your theory um, based on E8, which is depicted in this crystal block for those who are viewing on YouTube. Thanks for bringing your kryptonite to the show. <laughs> um, your approach to this is to say, let's start out with some object that is mathematically distinguished and very peculiar, effectively right. like a platypus of the mathematical world. And let's try to distill from this thing that has to exist for reasons of logical necessity and is ex maybe the most complicated naturally occurring object, um, arguably, that you could pick. And let's find the richness of our natural world as distilled from this bizarre um, freakish occurrence in the laws of mathematical necessity. Is that a fair telling? Um, from a top-down perspective, it is. But the way I got there is by describing spinners and seeing that spinners is part of this one beautiful mathematical object, naturally. And it's, it's unique to the exceptional Lie groups, to, to, to these, this class, this small class of objects. And when you say exceptional Lie groups, what you mean is Platypi. continuous symmetries that only occur once, that they don't fall into some regular pattern. Right. Okay. And... Uh, and spinners are naturally a part of their geometry and they're, and they're, and they're, they're intricate, beautiful objects. They have spinners naturally as part of their geometry. And that if you dissect them, you can see all the other parts necessary to particle physics and gravity. And this was just stunning to me. And at this point I'm like, all right, I've, I've built up from the ground up from, from particle physics and from gravity and from spinners, I've built this structure up and seeing how it's all interconnected. And I found that they're all part of this small class of mathematical objects that are, that are unique in their intricacy and beauty um, for finite dimensional objects. 
And that's why now I appear to have adopted more of a top-down view where it seems like, oh, I started with this pretty object and I said, oh, look, it explains everything, but it's, it's nowhere near like that, how I actually got to there, All right? The, the truth is I'm building up. And the truth is the next object is going to be higher dimensional objects that include uh, E8 like this one as a, as a subgroup. So the way I'm hearing you, Garrett, and again, you know, this is like one of the most obscure. <laughs> this con- is going to lose some of your listeners, but I, well, I, it's gonna, I'm, I'm happy to talk about well, it. Well, but so. I'm trying to, we're trying to describe this. I would like to describe this a little bit as, as if we were taking somebody to an opera in a foreign language so that they can follow the plot, even though they can't follow line by line. Okay. The way I see what you're saying is, is that there is a usual kind of symmetry which we would associate with bosons, that is the force particles of the universe. And what makes these very strange objects that you've, you've referred to as in, in referring to exceptional Lie groups is that you appear to take something from the fermionic universe, that is the sp- spinorial universe, where the spinners come from, and you adjoin it in some sense to the bosonic to get more symmetries. Yes. Yeah, that's very clear. Okay. There's a huge problem with the strategy. Well, wait, but this, but you're forgetting the part where this structure exists as part of these exceptional objects. Well, no, no, I'm not. You've correctly described how these objects occur in nature, that there is some regular kind of typical symmetry, a bosonic symmetry. Then you you take some of these spinners that are related to that symmetry and you fuse them together to get an even more beautiful, weird, symmetric object. But the problem with that strategy Mm -hmm. is, is that we know that nature has these two very different recipes for how she wants to treat these things quantum mechanically. Right. One of them goes under the name of bosonic uh, quantization, and the other sort of goes under the name sometimes of, of you know, Berezin theory or right. And anti-commuting numbers, numbers were a times B equals a negative B times a parallel, totally different treatment. And the way you've done it, you've really taken the fermions. That is the matter part, the, the spinners that we've been discussing, mm-hmm. you've lumped them together with the bosons. And now they're fused in a way that it's going to be almost impossible to treat the spinners in a, manner befitting fermionic quantization. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very straightforward though. The, the fermions just end up being along directions orthogonal to space time. I don't see that that actually works. I mean, this is, this is my great, my, my criticisms of your theory, which we've known each other now for 11 years. And this is the basis of our antagonism is that on the one hand, um, you ingeniously saw, and I give you your credit, that E8, the largest of these objects, a 248 dimensional behemoth, carried some numerology surrounding three copies of the spinners that are present, which looked in some sense, could be confused for, may be related to three copies of matter. (laughs) It was about that hand wavy, yeah. Okay. so. All the honor to you. That's not an obvious feature. Most people who barely know what the exceptional Lie groups are, most of them don't know that it has to do with this property called triality. Okay. That was, that was true, but there really wasn't, in my opinion, enough room to pack the particles that we currently see into this group structure Mm -hmm. um, with three generations. That was one issue. Second of all, because the, of the of the particular way in which bosons and fermions, matter and force, were fused together, it really pushed everything towards the bosonic side, that is the force side of the equation. So you're going to now have to be in some kind of technical debt where you would have to figure out how to get the fermions back into a matter framework because you would actually push them too far through unification into a a union with force. That was another basic concern. Mm -hmm. And um, my last concern was that because of the properties of this object, you didn't have any room for what we call chirality. 
in which the universe um, that we've seen so far appears to have a left-right asymmetry to it. It's as if it has a beauty mark. And these, um, the any object that you derive from E8 is gonna be very hard to get it to have a beauty mark because E8 doesn't have a beauty mark itself. So these were three things that you were going to have to pay back right. uh, if you were going to connect this to, to the world that we see. And I, my yeah, no, irritation these, with you was is that I yeah. brought this up with you in 2000, and, you remind me, 2008, not 2009, right. when we met at the Perimeter Institute. Yeah. And I tried to warn you about these things. I felt like you never took me seriously. No, I did take you seriously. I've taken all of these problems seriously. And uh, they're, discussed in subsequent work and uh, the way I've been resolving them is by tackling a, a larger unspoken problem, which is how to have a quantum description of this sort of geometry, All right? Because our universe is a, a quantum universe and E8 is a finite dimensional object and you have to have multiple states, multiple numbers of particles be able to occupy every state. So if you have a, a full quantum description of a theory, you need an infinite dimensional geometry to do it. Well, I, I always thought your your goal was to take a finite object and then take waves on that finite object to create something that was going to be infinite dimensional. I didn't see right. that as that's, being its but, problem. But that's not good enough. Yeah. Say more. Because just, just, just when you talk about waves on a geometric object, those act as different representations mathematically because of the Peter Weil theorem. But when you... Uh, when you do that, that's not enough to give you all the structure you need for quantum field theory. You really need an, a fundamentally infinite dimensional geometric object to describe quantum field theory. And, and, this, and, and by looking at what sort of objects you need that include exceptional Lie groups, but are infinite dimensional geometries that can correspond to quantum field theory, that's how you tackle the three problems you discussed. You, you, get, you, have, you can have more space to handle the three generations of particles. You can have uh, the uh, anti-commuting fermions in them so that, that they behave like fermions should, like matter particles should. And it's also you know, large enough to give you the sort of dynamics you need for quantum field theory. So that's why I've, I've, I've in the intervening 10 years since we've had a deep discussion about this, I've now started looking at generalized infinite dimensional geometries which are, are gener infinite dimensional generalizations of Lie groups, which, which solve these problems. And that's, that's why I've been You really working. believe that you've solved these problems? I think I have a really good description that goes a long way Garrett, towards these things. Here's the thing. If I just think about where we are with the standard model, right? you've got four dimensions of space and time, right? Then you've got an extra eight dimensions uh, coming from something called SU3, three dimensions from something called SU2, and one extra dimension coming from something called U1. Mm -hmm. That's the basic data right. um, that occurs. And, and, and gravity, people leave out gravity. You, you could put in six dimensions for something called spin three one, yeah. okay? But the point is I can add those all up and I'm gonna get some, some number probably, you know, in 20s of dimen 20 some odd dimensions, whatever. That finite thing mm -hmm. generates the infinite dimensional world of quantum field theory. Well, wait a minute, but quantum field theory, there, we have a way of mapping between those ba the base geometry and then going to quantum field theory, right? And then you have Fox space, right? And you have occupation numbers for all the different possible states. Garrett, my point is you're working on a problem that has certain foreseeable problems as part of the challenge. And unlike your detractors from the more standard community, um, I'm, not, I'm not telling you that you're dead on arrival just because certain problems can be seen, that would be unfair. And then by the way, that's what, you know, there are lots of problems that can be seen from the string theory community where let's say, you know, the, the number of dimensions it wants to play in is, doesn't seem to be the right number or that they, they thought there were only a finite number of theories. It turns out that there's a continuum of theories, or, et cetera. Or the vast majority come out with. Right. Like and, and, and I get very things. irritated that somehow the string theory community uh, is entitled to make all these mistakes and anybody outside, if they say one wrong thing or one seemingly wrong thing, they're excommunicated. It's a ridiculous standard. That's not what I'm trying to do to you. I'm trying to say something very different, which is 
you're going to be up against the fact that if your initial data comes from this most beautiful and most bizarre of all objects, E8, right. and it doesn't I, contain- As I that, said, I'm now working on its generalizations to infinite dimensions. But there's an it, issue of intellectual check kiting. Like, I don't mind the idea that you recognize the debts that you're in, mm -hmm. and then you say, I think I have a way of getting this thing to close off. Right. But there is a question of, well, now that you've recognized, am I right? I mean, am I right? No, you're absolutely the, right. Am I, I right I, that the issues that I raised with you initially turned out to be really serious problems? Of course. I mean, and most But you of didn't those, know that back then. Yeah, they, I did. They were, they were in the paper. They were in the original paper saying that the, the description of three generations was very hand wavy and unsatisfactory. That's in the original paper. Okay. My recollection was that when I tried to explain to you why people were going to have the objection about the two different quantization schemes, that that was not handled correctly. Right. Well, I handled that in a paper in 2010 or so. Okay. So that was group cosmology. All right. That was one of the, the issues. Yep. Then there was going to be an issue that you weren't able to bring the left, right asymmetry out of the initial data. There wasn't enough. Right. And that was a fair description. Absolutely. Okay. And then you're saying that the, um, I ceded to you that you were making a connection between the mysterious appearance of three copies of matter uh, and something called triality, which was right. not manifest obviously inside of E8, but to the few people who actually care about this structure, it it, it definitely is there in a very profound way. Yeah, it, it, it relates to rotations in eight dimensional spaces. Yes. But you also haven't taken an interest in what is E8 if not the uh the wellspring for the source code of the universe like if it isn't the universe i think it's a piece of it but I, i'm not religious eric i mean i'm i'm going to explore whatever seems most promising to explore okay and well I, do you have you changed your your sense of the status of e8 as a candidate for the unified theory in the fashion that you were originally seeing it? absolutely you have changed your, your view. yes can you talk about that right um, so it was in tackling quantum field theory and how to describe it geometrically, which as far as I know, nobody has done. I mean, whenever, whenever you have, you, you start with, as you say, U1, SU2, SU3, and, and you go through this quantization procedure for its field. So you get a quantum yeah. field theory, or if you're dealing with strings, right? right? You have this model of, of vibrating strings in higher dimensions. Then you go through this quantization procedure to get a quantum, quantum theory of strings. Okay. Right. We have, we, physicists have this toolkit for quantizing things but that's utterly the wrong way to look at reality if if the universe is just one thing which it is then it's one mathematical object i mean you're making a point that is very well understood i believe in the right. standard theoretical so, physics community which is that if the world starts off as quantum right you should talk about classicalizing pieces of it that's rather exactly than right. quantizing the classical pieces that appear to exist yeah that's exactly right so, so what's a quantum geometric object look like? It's an, you know, with, with all these infinite dimensional Fox space and the creation and annihilation of, of elementary particles people, possible. People at home won't know what a Fox space is. A right. Fox space is effectively where the states of the system can live when you have multiple particles in a situation and you can change the number of particles that you have just the way a photon can break into an electron and a, a positron pair, um, that would be possible in a Fox space, not possible in a simpler quantum system. That's right. So effectively a Fox space is just a large place to play where the number of particles in the system can change. Up to infinity. Keep going. So in order to describe this as one geometric object, you're stuck with a generalized Lie group, infinite dimensional generalized Lie group. Yes. And in order to describe spinners, it's going to be an exceptional generalized Lie group. Garrett, I don't think, I don't think you're adding anything. I think that the problem here is, is that E8 um, is an exceptionally beautiful, exceptionally interesting object. It did have the properties that you were talking about and that it unifies um, standard symmetries with these spinners right. to form new symmetries. That's right. But, but it's it inadequate. does. 
what? It's, it's not only inadequate, it, it would push them into a universe of pure force rather than a universe divided between force and matter. You're actually, the problem is, is that the kind of unification it would create would be completely force unification with, with an absence of matter. You'd be dragging matter, if you will, spinners. Yeah, you're, you're, you're focusing on a problem that, that, that was, uh, you know, that was solved in a paper in 2010, but it, it's very simply that fermions are orthogonal to space time. Whereas, uh, you know, the force fields, the boson fields are along space time. But the same way, the, the same way, if you have two force fields that are along space time, but in different directions, they would anti-commute, right? So what you're doing is you're using space time, if you will, which is a, again, a kind of a classical Einsteinian concept right. to break apart a unified system, which was the intention in unification to begin with. Right. And then you're going to try to treat these two things naturally, uh, according to two totally different prescriptions. That's right. that you're violating. I mean, in some sense, any kind of naturality that you just picked up in the unification to begin with. Um, in a sense. Yeah. But the symmetry has to break somehow. Does it do it in a natural? I mean, this doesn't feel, this feels yeah, like probably a fudge. Not. It, it allows it. It doesn't seem completely natural, but it, it does allow it. Well, but the whole point of the thing I thought was to take the naturality and what we had understood about the nature of these exceptional objects mm -hmm. and to say, hey, these things actually unify beautifully inside uh, of these very unusual, elegant mathematical structures. They do, but it was, it was too small. As you said, it was too small because it didn't correctly contain three generations of, of matter and because it can't correctly portray quantum field theory. But once you go to the to larger generalized Lie groups, it can. Well, you know, if this was a startup, what you're saying is, is that the business is going great, but it's just run out of money and I need a fresh infusion of cash. <laughs> No, I'm not kidding. This is <laughs> no, no, this is sounding no, no, no. like an intellectual check kiting. No, no, it's it's it's, it's round B funding. <laughs> Series B. <laughs> I see. Um, are, is it cash flow positive? <laughs> not yet. I haven't even put the paper out yet. Okay. So the, there's. I mean, I, I look. It's not a question that I, I need to see the paper or that you're not allowed to take out more loans. But are you getting? I mean, I know you to be. Look, I've. I, I hate to say this, but I have defended you to the regular community uh, with some frequency because I have viewed you as an honest broker for your own stuff. I don't think you're trying to get away with something. I think Thank you. what you try, what you're trying to do, is you're trying to say I need to take some advances, which I think and I hope I can pay back, which I think is an admirable and honorable way to do physics. Mm -hmm. Are you worried about your own theory? Are you worried that you're going to infinite dimensions? in the way that you've been forced to modify on several previous occasions. And that in fact, this is not going to close. I am unusually confident that I'm on the right track with this one. Really? Yeah. Oy. There, there are too many things matching up in the right way. This doesn't sound good, Garrett. I gotta I'm be not. honest with you. <laughs> um, but you see, I, I, I will put a paper out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, people may not find it interesting or they might find it really interesting. Well, I wish you the best of luck, but <laughs> I, I have to tell you that I do think that the problems in this program, I mean, again, I, I, I should just be honest about it. I thought that the choice of E8 was so natural that they're really one of two choices that I can see as being the way to go if you're going to avoid the, the usual um, paths in in research into into fundamental physics one is that you f start with the most beautiful intricate object you can find and then you find the intricacies of the natural world somehow living uh inside of the intricacies which occurred right. naturally that's that the, would be the, that's e the top down view and it's, right. and it's quite nice to look at it that way the bottom up view is that somehow you start with something that's practically lifeless which i've analogized to a fertilized egg and somehow it bootstraps itself into this weird, intricate um, and Baroque world that we find ourselves in. And it sort of auto, the universe auto catalyzes from almost nothing. And these are the two 
basic approaches that I can imagine that would not strain the concept of a theory of everything. Right. Well, we, we both engage in both of these. But once you've used this bottom-up approach, right, starting with your fertilized egg and, and getting up into more and more complexity, then you start to see a complete object after you've expanded it out. Sorry, you view yourself as exploring the concept of... Going from the bottom up. What is it that you've done that, that has that character? Um, starting from gravity and particle physics and how they can be matched up together in a, in a, in a way that brings Neither spinners the, about natural. Okay. That's, that's not very simple at all. Well, I know gravity, but, gravity is already, you know, you're, you're talking about the curvature of a space time manifold. Oh, it's beautiful stuff though. I love it. No, it's absolutely gorgeous. I don't think we're, we're divided by that, but when it comes to, um, you know, breaking up, this object called the curvature tensor into three different pieces, throwing one of the one of them away called the vial curvature, and then fine tuning the other two to be equal to the matter uh, and energy in the universe. There's a lot of stuff that's going into that story that isn't. I mean, that's an intricate story, and then the other yeah. story is even worse and right. weirder. Yeah. So you know, you're, you're smuggling in a ton of complexity. When I say fertilized egg, um, I'm thinking at the level of cytology, but you know, at the level of the actual DNA, that's incredibly rich. So when, when I, you know, maybe it's a bad analogy because it's not bootstrapping itself out of nothing, right? You're smuggling in a ton of intricacy, but you have to look in both directions. You have to look from the bottom up. And then once you can see the larger picture, then you have to look again, from the top down. And if going that way from the top down doesn't match up very well with, with what you did to get there, then you have to go further and see if you can get a different, bigger picture. It's the only way forward. It, Garrett, but I, I mean, to be honest, I, I feel like, you know, this is something has run into a wall and there's the sense that like, how could this beautiful structure not be, not be right? It doesn't feel to me like it's insufficient. Yeah. Yeah. And there, but there, there's, there are larger structures that are not finite dimensional, but they're still Lie groups and exceptional Lie groups. They're just generalized infinite dimensional Lie groups that contain E8 as a substructure and they're beautiful. They're just as beautiful, if not more so. I really don't. I think that the the problem is, is that, you know, we have this mutual friend, Sabine Hassenfelder. And Sabine has this very strange um, feature of her personality that she needs to tell the truth at scale. <laughs> oh, well, Sabina is a scientist and uh, scientists, you know, engage in the truth at all costs. Yes, it's, but it's sort of our, our modus operandi. Well, I find it very interesting that almost no one has followed Sabine's lead. I think it's Sabina. Sabina? Yeah. Okay. Um, from her perspective, um, beauty has led theoretical physics astray. Right. Now, I've, I've tangled with her. My claim is, is that the, the string theory community, which has generally hoovered up the most brilliant minds, but turned them into kind of almost cult-like members, which are exploring some structure, but I just don't, it's, it's similar to E8 in the sense that I'm not positive that it's the structure of our world. It has some beauty and some consistency, but I'm not positive that that's its reason for being. And because that argument has been so abusive and it, it, it's just been, it's been abused against other people that our work is beautiful. And then when those outsiders look at it, it doesn't look like what you're doing is that beautiful at all. Um, she's gone against beauty as a means of trying to figure out what's true and what, what isn't. Um, I'm concerned that you're falling prey to the siren of beauty where you're not coupling, you're not things that are beautiful that there are many things that are beautiful that don't exist to do what you think they're there to do. Well, that's definitely true. I'm definitely inspired by beautiful mathematical objects. When I start exploring an area of mathematics and I, I start to see its intricacies 
and its connection to fundamental physics, I am led to, to think that there might be something there based on aesthetics. Well, and I, and I've also discussed this with Sabina, who I think is great and her, her points are wonderful, but I would be lost if I didn't have this aesthetic sense as a guide. Well, let's, let's take an example, like the hydrogen atom. So you've got one proton at the center of a, a hydrogen atom and you have all of the electron shells in quantum theory that are generated by the Coulomb potential that comes off of that nucleus, right? right. Okay. That story of chemistry is just being these perfectly spherical electron shells um, works pretty well. Well, you have the other orbitals, you know, P orbitals, S orbitals, D orbitals, all these things, yeah. Yeah, in terms of the representation theory of something we'd call spin three that gives the symmetries of, of the system. That story is not, it, it, it is absolutely be gorgeous. It's beautiful and it works pretty darn well. Mm -hmm. But it starts to fall apart the larger the atoms are and the more neutrons and protons are stuck together in the, in the nucleus. It gets much more subtle, yeah. Well, it's, it's a perfectly beautiful story that isn't the right story. It's not the true story. It's very close to a true story. It's suggestive, it's indicative, mm -hmm. but it isn't actually the true story itself. So you have to be very careful in my mind that you, you, you don't fall into the trap of thinking that the hydrogen atom sort of generalizes its perfection is simply the story of chemistry. Right, of course, they're, they're much more complex elements and then grouped into molecules and there's all sorts of things that go into, into that sort of chemistry. Well, but do you, don't you have the same situation in theoretical physics where you have certain kinds of beauty that are incredibly pure that actually kind of fall apart under scrutiny and you have other kinds of uh, beauty that seem to fall apart but actually go the distance. I'm thinking about... Dirac's um, discovery of antimatter as the corresponding solutions to the matter solution. Right. And didn't you usually think that was that the anti electrons were, that were actually protons? In because his they only knew of those two yeah. particles. And then yeah. Heisenberg uh, tried to pop his bu bubble and said, yeah. um, you know. You the, actually have a new particle here. Well, no, he said that the proton was way too heavy to be the uh, antiparticle mirror of the electron. And I think Dirac sort of recanted, but Dirac should have had the courage of his convictions and said, I predict that there will be two new particles, an antiproton and an anti-electron, which was called the positron. And both of those things turned out to be true. Yeah, and that's considered a victory for the aesthetic of beauty in mathematical physics. Yes, but there was an intermediate there was. situation in which there was. the beauty led Dirac astray because he wanted to, to shoehorn his theory into the pre-existing world that was understood. That's right. So it, it's important to be cautious, but and careful. Yeah. But not too cautious. So if you're if the mathematics is actually telling you something, you want to listen to it. What's the mathematics telling you? It's telling me that I think I've got the first handle on a geometric description of quantum field theory. Garrett, I, I say that <laughs> I say this out of love, and I hope not envy. I'm super yeah. concerned that you can see the problems from here yeah. and that rather than just going to infinite dimensions and saying that quantum field theory requires um, a jump from finite to infinite dimensions, yeah. you can say, look, I, I am fighting the fact that the, the beautiful unification that I found mm -hmm. actually is going to be challenged at the quantum level where that beauty becomes my enemy. I would never put it that way. I know, because you, what you did is you, you took a theory. I mean, to be honest, there's a different set of objects called the uh, exceptional isomorphisms, which aren't the exceptional Lie groups that have the exact same property that you found, where you take something from the force universe. Let's say there's some object called uh, spin six, uh, which by an exceptional isomorphism is equivalent to some other object, surprisingly, called SU4. Right. And you can take the spinners of spin six and find out that they are just the 
four dimensional object from SU4 right. and smush them together and you get an analog of E8. Yeah, there there is also probably not used by the physical universe in any way that we think of as being important. I, I don't think that that feature is what you think it is. Right, but there are a vast world of mathematical possibilities out here and I think we need more people I totally agree all. with you that we need yeah. more people fanning out and trying things that look like they won't work. So we need a more exploratory culture. We need a more exploratory culture yep. and we need to be forgiving. What we don't need to do is to fool ourselves when we start getting the sense that maybe this stuff doesn't actually work. I mean, it just, right. it, it feels to me like I can sort of see what the next set of problems are going to be. And it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't say them at the beginning. Sure. But you know, you, you can't really dig into this stuff until you see the mathematical details well, of it. And, and this gets back to an issue of um, the question of how science should be organized. So we've talked about how difficult it is to do science inside of the institutions because um, there is such a pressure economically to do whatever's fashionable, to get lots of results, to publish continuously. Um, can we talk a little bit about what happens when uh, we try to do science outside of the institutions? Both of us have, um, and I think people will be very surprised to hear it, been rather critical of um, how hard it is to do science when you're not part of the standard community. Right. I mean, I think in some sense it is essential to say, to stay connected with the scientific community, even when you're exploring out almost entirely on your own. Um, you, one thing that has to happen is you have to have an extreme set of internal checks on your own progress. And because it, it, science is extremely frustrating to work on, most of the pathways you follow are, end up being dead ends. And it can be really frustrating. So in doing that, um, if you're going to work outside academia, you also need an extremely strong uh, support system and a healthy life independent of the science you're working on. So you need to have good support from friends and family, uh, good relationships. Um, you need to have confidence in your ability to support yourself and, and that frees up your time if you're really going to work on stuff outside of academia on your own. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, to, to build and to, and to have those things. I feel really lucky to be able to do that. And I, I think I've had a really good life that way. And, uh, but if, if you're going to do that, you need to be really careful about it because if you, if you, if you just abandon everything else, cause you have this idea in science that you want to pursue and you abandon everything else, you're, you'll, you'll be totally out of balance in your life. And if you hit some frustrating item in, in, in what you're researching, it'll be crushing because the main thing you're working on and focused on stopped working when really what you want to be able to do is like, Oh, I've got other stuff going on that, that's keeping me happy. This thing didn't work out. I just have to wipe the board clean and start fresh. And that's not devastating to do because the rest of your life is good. You have to do that. Otherwise you'll, you just won't be healthy as a human being. Okay. And you have created something that you think might be an intermediate between being in total isolation and being hooked up to the community, uh, that lives within its, it, the standard institutional structures. That's right. That's right. I mean, I've, I came to this idea when I was wandering from friend's house to friend's house after getting my PhD, I would basically uh, go hang out with a friend I hadn't seen in a while. And if they had extra space, I, I, I spent time in their house while I worked on theoretical physics and enjoyed the local environment. And I thought it was great to be able to do this because you're, you're not worried about, you know, having a roof over your head. Um, you have company to interact with and you have a good environment to play in. And uh, I wanted to have a network of such places, but I, I had a hard time getting friends to give me their houses to use for this. So I, I ended up getting the resources together to, to buy a house in Maui and, uh, and to start bringing friends and visiting scientists in. And I've uh, called this the Pacific Science Institute. And currently it's basically my house with delusions of grandeur, because what I also have is a, is a beautiful piece of property that's uh, 15 acres that I bought 10 years ago because I like doing things slowly. Mm -hmm. So I've been growing the community of the Pacific Science Institute by, by having friends come in and, and stay at my house, including you. 
and my arch nemesis. I had a, I had a great time despite <laughs> the obvious antagonism. Um, and and uh, for you specifically, I tried to kill you in several different ways. Through <laughs> oh, is that what, is that what, with the millipedes shark, and centipedes? Yeah, were, and shark infested water. Yeah, oh it was, sure, it was great. The rough corals. Um, um, but uh, but yeah, basically, I have scientists visit uh, and uh, take people out to have fun around the island and really enjoy a good environment where uh, they're free to explore. Uh, ideas that might be a little bit on the, the dangerous side to, to work on while they're in the confines of academia and among their normal colleagues. It's a, it's a place where you can explore a little bit wilder ideas. Um, and I'm really excited to grow this community by, uh, by, by starting to design things to build on the 15 acres I've got. That's really in a nice location. So I, I'm, I've been growing things slowly up here and I'm really looking forward to some more progress with it and, uh, and growing this community. It's, and it's, it's also been uh, a nice balance against working on physics directly because it's it's guaranteed success. I mean, when you when you have a place in Maui for for scientists to come hang out and have a good time, that's that's going to happen, and also it keeps me entertained to have good people coming through. No, that's fantastic. So yeah. it works out for yourself. <laughs> Can you um, just? I'm curious from your perspective, how do you see uh, the two of us as being divided in our approaches? To the community i mean i would definitely say that i i seem to be more connected to the sensibilities of the elite science community i know that i can get their noses out of joint but i'm i, I track them very carefully yeah you had a lot of fights with those guys okay yeah whereas i i didn't so my our academic uh, lineages are quite different I mean, I went, I went to a smaller school. I went to UC San Diego and didn't go to Harvard. Um, but, uh, you know, my advisor there in particle physics was Roger Dashen, but he, he passed away while I was a graduate student. And I, I finished up my, my dissertation under, under Henry Barbanel, who also had a background in particle physics, but it changed in nonlinear dynamics. But, but in some sense, you were a self-advised PhD. Yeah. So I was very much self-directed. Um, Henry gave me the freedom to go explore whatever the heck I wanted. I, I had an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of freedom as a graduate student. Um, and I hit this problem with spinners. And that's what I wanted to tackle. I wanted to figure out what they were geometrically. And no one else was interested in that problem. Okay. But through academia, I was a straight-A student. You know, I did really well. I never had any big conflicts. Was with it easy for around. you? Yeah. It was. I spent a lot of the time surfing. I was living on the beach in La Jolla. It was beautiful. It was the greatest time of my life. Okay. You know, people talk about, you know, uh, small, you know, being in a small pond, big fish in a small pond and going to a bigger pond. You feel humbled. I never really had that experience. I was, a, I, I, I was pretty, pretty close to the top of my class and really happy about it, how everything was going. Everything was great. I got my PhD, but there was no way I was going to get a job trying to understand the geometry of spinners when everybody else was doing string theory. So you had already accepted that you were unemployable. Yeah, I was totally unemployable, but I invested in Apple stock in the nineties. So I had a few money. So I said, see you guys, I'm gonna go surf in Maui and work on this stuff on my own. Whereas you had a very different experience. So you were, you were, you were in Harvard in the math department studying mathematical physics. And, and as far as I know, you were making some really unusual breakthroughs that were very ahead of their time, but you, you weren't welcomed by the, the head of the, pe the head people there. And so you so you had, you had a, a conflict from the get go. Well, I had a very I had a very serious dispute about something in mathematics, which were called the self dual equations, self dual Yang Mills equations, which were related to the regular Yang Mills equations, which are the equations of force uh, in the standard model. But the self dual Yang Mills equations were sort of a square root of those equations, and they were very difficult to work with and to solve. And I was very confused as to why people were investing in this particular form of these equations when it felt to me that we hadn't asked what constellation of equations these new equations belong to. And I'd propose, again, spinners as a means of um, changing the equations and was told that if, I mean, the exact quote was something like, if spinners had anything to do with the story, Nigel, who was Nigel Hitchin, would have told us. Like, it was just completely, yeah. it was bananas. And then I got into this issue that, well, you know, spinners have to be quantized as fermions, that is, they have to be treated as if they were matter uh, 
inside of quantum field theory, but this was not like we weren't doing quantum field theory. We were just doing classical geometry of a kind. And so none of the arguments I put forward, the set of equations, um, which later got recognized and completely changed the field, which came through Ed Witten and this guy called Natty Seiberg, uh, both of them now professors at the Institute. Um, and there was just no room to question why everybody was struggling with these almost intractable equations and just, you know, getting great results, but with so much effort and work. So that was like a very weird story whereby, um, you know, I think that by 1994, the Harvard department had woken up to the fact that it was not using the right equations. And I'd been actually proposing several sets of different equations. Um, but that, you know, when, when this all, you know, came about uh, late, late eighties, early nineties, uh, there was just no way to, to have a productive conversation about it. Right. So you found yourself at odds with the, the people you were talking with and, and you decided to go into finance instead or how, how'd that happen? No, I mean, I, I wanted, I was trying to get back to physics and the, you know, I was proposing, I had proposed three sets of equations. Um, one of which it turned out to have been done by somebody else in some place that I didn't know anything about. One of which later, um, gets done by Cyberg and Witten. And then another set of equations that um, I wanted to connect to the actual standard model. And the, the department was just very concerned that this didn't really have anything to do with actual physics. It was sort of a coincidence in their mind that something that was vaguely physics-y was having great topological results. And so there was this you know, this fear. And I was sent to a guy named Sidney Coleman, who was a great quantum theorist. And he was much more encouraging than the Harvard math department. Yeah, Sidney Coleman was a great guy. I mean, an unbelievable human being. I had two memories of him. One of which was that uh, he had all the time in the world for people who had no idea what they were doing. And the other was that he didn't suffer fools gladly. And then I realized that those are two contradictory images. And I, <laughs> I, I unearthed old footage of him. He, he gave this brilliant lecture called quantum mechanics in your face to try to make the quantum. Have you ever seen this thing? I have not. Oh, it's a work of art. You'd love it. Um, and it turns out both of these things were really true about him that he, he had, if, if you were full of yourself and you were wrong, he would just cut you up into little pieces. But if you said, I don't quite understand this. He had all the time in the world to be the greatest of teachers. No, I mean, one of the marks of a, of a good scientist is humility. E, no, no. One of the marks of a good scientist <laughs> is, a, is a dialectic between arrogance and humility. If you right. don't have, that's a more subtle and accurate way of putting it. Yeah. Well, no, I just, I, I, I worry about us extolling the virtues of the humble, the meek, right. the self-effacing. And it's just like, that's not where the magic happens. But the you magic have to, happens. You have to have nature. had the arrogance to tackle hard problems, right? And made some progress, but then been kicked back by sure. something that didn't work right. I and agree. after enough of that, you develop some humility, but you still have to maintain the arrogance to get anywhere. So, how do you feel currently about about the community, like the professional community? You have to know that they regard yeah. you yeah. with very. I mean, well, I, I know what's going on. I mean, there, I, I got a lot of contempt from string theorists for right. getting, for getting attention, for putting forward a mathematical model of reality that wasn't strings and it, and it wasn't complete. It was, it, it had, it was a model that was proposed that had problems with it. And I was forthcoming with the problems in it, but I was still saying, yeah, this is, this seems like it's making progress towards the description of reality and has nothing to do with strings. And that set alarm bells off all over the place. It set off alarm bells for either it's a threat or this guy's a complete crackpot, which is more likely. And and I got criticisms from bo for both. I don't think if I were to steal me in their perspective, and again, you know that I don't share it, and I'm willing to fight them. And I as as I did when um, you first encountered uh, what I called their immune system in a in a gentleman known as Jacques Distler, right? right? I'm willing to stand up for what it is you're trying to do, but I do think that we have to give them their due before 
we say what's wrong with their perspective. Their perspective is there are lots of constraints that one learns are very difficult to evade when you immerse yourself in standard quantum field theory. Like they know what it is that is demotivating them. It's all the no-go theorems and the, the intricacies. And the reason they got crazy about string theory, first of all, I'm convinced that it was a way of evading the real problems in physics. It gave them something to do. It's like, like war games it's for a, it's general an amazing period toolkit. of peace. Well, yeah, it gives you something to do to keep your chops up that is different from the thing you're supposed to be doing. Right. And what they were objecting to is to say, this guy doesn't understand all the things that have to go right in order to do an may have an improvement on the theory mm -hmm. from our perspective how dare he um blithely saunter forth if we ignored all the constraints on us uh we could have fun proposing all sorts of things that also won't work that was really the responsible version of their critique now the irresponsible version of their critique is hey we have something that isn't working very well how dare he take something that isn't working very well and get attention Right. And maybe funding or maybe destroy the sense that there's only one game in town. Right. And, you know, I was separately lobbying you and them for different things. I wanted you to just say the words like, I understand these are the constraints that will have to be satisfied. And I don't have answers and I don't know how difficult they'll be to find, but I don't want to be demotivated from the get go. Right. So please don't immediately tell me all the no go theorems because it, any successful theory will probably have to have a period where it's flying in the face of no-go theory. So that's what right. I wanted to hear from you. Right. I believe I said those things scattered over several interviews at the time. Somewhat, but I think that I, I think that what they don't intuit is that you understand how how significant the negative results are. The no-go theorems, as they're called, are pretty profound. Right. I mean, there's a theorem called the coleman mandula theorem that prohibits the unification of gravity with the other forces. And I just blew right through that because it didn't seem to apply in, in what I was doing. Well, it, I mean, really, it, it, it prohibits naive unification of matter and force. And there's a way of evading it using this thing called supersymmetry. Right. And supersymmetry is this very weird thing that doesn't have that much mathematical beauty behind it. So the mathematicians know about it. They study it a little bit, but they're not bananas over it. Yeah, I'm not either. <laughs> the, the natural world doesn't seem to use it in the expected way, no. but it does so much for theoretical physics that despite the fact that math is just kind of ho-hum on it and that the natural world doesn't seem to be using it, it doesn't stop the theoretical uh, physics community from embracing that because it evades this dreaded no-go theory. Right. It stopped me from uh, from embracing it. I never embraced supersymmetry. I never I never liked it. But you didn't evade the problem with it either. I mean, in no, other words, I, I, you, I the, got the around it. You think you really got around it? The Coleman Mandula theorem. Yeah, it, it requires as one of its axioms that you have to have, you know, certain it talks about properties of the scattering of of particles. And you have to have a space-time in which the scattering occurs. In, in the theory I put forward, the space-time comes out after the symmetry breaking between gravity and, and forces. So it's only after the symmetry breaking happens when the unification is no longer there. Yeah, I'm sure that you that have space-time. I and don't. Then in that context, the theorem applies. My, but before my guess, that breaking, it doesn't well, apply. But my guess is, and I could be wrong about this because I haven't studied exactly what you're talking about. That what's going to happen is that even with how you, you claim this arises in your theory, they're going to say in whatever approximation is going to be applied to relatively mm -hmm. flat space times close to Minkowski space, yeah. that if you've really evaded it in some super meaningful way, you should be able to tell us some theorem about good old uh, quantum field theory in relatively flat space time. Right. Well, I mean, it, it evades it by not satisfying the axioms of the theorem. You, do you know what I'm trying to get at? Um, it's not evading it in some You should be able to tell us something way. really new if, you've, if your underlying theory mm -hmm. truly unifies force and matter. Right. 
it would be the case that the approximation of it that is found in ordinary regions that look close to flat, right? Where quantum, mm -hmm. the usual rules of quantum field theory apply. It, it should be telling us something wildly new about that. Can you tell us a new theorem about how it would appear to unify force and matter in a region that looks close to classical quantum field theory, to, to, to standard quantum field theory? Well, I mean, once the theory is advanced to the stage where you can get to that description, yeah, then that would happen. But in the initial stages, all you can see for certain is that it's not violating the theorem. I don't know enough about all right. How, how we, those... we can talk about it after this. Okay, but, sure. But, uh, but, but anyway, I, I hit so, a number of these things. So, so those were my, I had these wishes for you, and then I had a, the wishes for the community, which is that they would stop being pricks about the whole thing, and that they would say, look, we can't keep telling everybody who's not a string theory, th string theorist, that their theory is dead on arrival, and keep saying, well, we know that our theory uh, it doesn't appear to be living in four dimensions and appears to have a bunch of stuff that we don't want and not necessarily all the stuff that we do want. And maybe there's a huge landscape of different theories that would. Yeah. At this point, I don't think string theory is living at all. I think it's an X theory. I think it's pining for the fjords. I mean, it's, 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 I've seen nothing but decline since I left this train wreck. Well, this is the thing is it refuses to take stock of itself and it took a lot more minds than I, one. I think that's happening. Yeah. Certainly the graduate students who are, who are coming up are, are seeing what's going on with string theory and, and they're taking stock of the field and they're going another direction. So where, where do we go next? Like, well, is there any way, I mean, I actually view it as highly demotivating that in essence, every new theory is dead on arrival because of the number of things. I mean, can we agree that physics has gotten incredibly difficult? It has. We have, it's, it's difficult by virtue of being so successful. I mean, this, the, the so you can smell that we're almost at the end, at yeah. least of this chapter. And we've exhausted everything that we know that has worked previously, which is yeah. like to vary the assumptions a little bit on, on every, and, and that's been spectacularly successful. And now it doesn't work anymore. And it hasn't worked for almost 50 years. Right. It's, it's incredibly frustrating. I think that's why most people are wise to stay the hell away from it. And I think a lot of the smarter minds are, are going into machine learning or even biophysics or, or just into other fields you're okay or, or, or even condensed matter. How do you feel about that? Um, I feel like I'm out in an island in the middle of the Pacific watching it from unfold from afar while I work on the puzzle myself in my own different way. You're having fun. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's my prime directive is have fun. Is to have fun. Yeah. And do you think that inducing other people to do this is kind of like maybe the big programs fall apart and we start just becoming individuals trying crazy strategies that probably won't work. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are undergraduate textbooks and undergraduate courses on string theory. Yeah. Okay. And people from undergraduates there, and, and, and there's this culture of arrogance saying is string theory is the pinnacle of physics. Right. And, and people are coming up to that and they're becoming, and if, if you're really working on, fundamental physics and, and the, the whole area of string theory has gotten so large in the amount of research done sure. that it just takes an enormous amount of intellectual effort to consume it and to get it up to speed on, to what the current status is of the field. And by the time you're there, you're so invested that of course, what you want to do is go and continue a postdoc in string theory when you graduate. And there, there are hundreds of students who are coming up this way. And when they get there, they go to HEPT like I did this morning. And they look Hept at the job. Being the high energy yeah. physics theory section where of, of this thing called the archive where all the new papers are, are found every day. Yeah. And 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 the this high energy physics archive also has a, a postdoc and job posting board. And just just for giggles, I went and say, okay, well, how many opportunities does a rising strength theorist have now? And I went and looked and, and there are all these subfields of physics. The condensed matter is a big party because it's so incredibly vibrant and, right. and productive right now. And you go into high energy theory and okay, there are 30 positions open in North America. Okay. All right. And some of them are open to strength theorists, but out of those 30 positions, you go, how many of them actually actively want a strength theorist and are looking for a strength theorist? There's one, one Eric. So you have these hundreds of people groomed up saying, String theory is the pinnacle of what you can be studying. 
and there's nowhere for them to go. Well, but this because was a, the field is dying. Well, because it was a baby boomer phenomenon. We we treated it as if it was an intellectual phenomenon, but it was actually this weird generational phenomenon that this took hold. Um, you know, there's this very weird feature of 1951 where Frank Wilczek and Ed Witten, two great physicists born in the same year, Wilczek is effectively like the last guy to make the train for real physics. Yeah. He is an amazing guy. Though. He's, yeah. And then Witten, born later that year, probably more powerful than anyone else alive in terms of his mental abilities, hasn't had a trip to Stockholm because he hasn't been able to make contact with the physical world. Yeah. And almost certainly in any era that wasn't this one, this guy would have been to Stockholm once or more. Yeah. And it, it, it's, a, in my mind, it's a cultural problem. We're stuck in this culture of particle physics where you have everybody in the same community studying the same popular direction in full force as if there was lots of data coming in supporting that. And there's not. So what it is, is they're going full bore, full self-supporting force along direction that in my mind just doesn't describe our universe. And what we need is an exploratory phase with physicists, with graduate students coming up and picking up stuff that they think is interesting and following that direction on their own, branching away from the main herd. And by having more explorers going in different directions, you're, you're more likely to find something good. And I guess my hope is that, you know, some graduate student will have listened through this incredibly long and detailed podcast and go look at stuff and say, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I want to learn more about that. Do you have any ideas or the Pacific Science Institute? Is, is there any way that our, our listeners can support it? Um, yeah. Are you a, I've, are you a nonprofit? I'm, I'm or? a 501c3 nonprofit. I'd be very happy to take donations and put those donations to use, supporting scientists. To diversify. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and these aren't just, phys it's not just supporting physicists. Um, the idea is that, as you said, science has supported our economy uh, to an incredible degree. And I don't think scientists have been sufficiently personally rewarded for that. So basically what I want to do is, you know, give them a nice place to hang out in Maui and enjoy the environment and work and think on whatever they want undirected while they do it. But so it's a I've, place to fight group think effectively yeah, within the is. field. While still having community support. While still having community support. The, the problem is I have very limited resources right now. I'm basically running this out of my house. Right. I have a big piece of land. I have dreams for what I want to build no, on you, it. And, you and I've the been there and it's, it's incredibly generous that people can hang out and just actually fulfill the promise of dreaming about our world and trying things that they wouldn't feel comfortable trying uh, under the watchful eyes of a departmental chairman who's telling them what they need That's to right. do to get chair, t tenure or, or to win grants. Uh, do you have any sense of what we should be directing people to do if they're in a position to change the culture of the field? I always want to think like, we still have a few old great people that everybody looks up to and they refuse to say something really provocative like here's the thing that i dream about we get all of the negative results they're incredibly demotivating allow your young people to violate several of them without being string theorists and then insist that they try to pay that back once they've been exploring a theory that in a previous era would have been dead on arrival because Somewhere we have to go backwards to go forwards. We have to question something yeah. that is rock solid in all of our minds, but isn't actually right. Don't I mean? Yeah, this is totally right. And, and this sort of cultural inertia that's holding things back is it's in biology, it's in computer science, it's in it's in all fields of science. So I, I would say just, I mean, it's almost the best thing to do just to find people who are really freaking smart and want to work on stuff on their own, give them money and support, and let them do it. And because, let, well, this is the yeah. I, I'm on record is saying that we have too much oversight, too much transparency, and too much accountability. It's strangling us. Yeah, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Well, Garrett, I really appreciate you sitting down. It's a hell of an experiment to just even try to have conversations about you know what might be uh, the path towards final theories of everything. And, and I'm actually really worried that we hurt most of your listeners. Well, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll do that. If we use this at all, I'll try to say something at the beginning of the program to try to say what it is that people are listening to. So they'll have an idea. They're not just going to stumble in on a podcast and hear people talking about bosons, fermions, E8 quantization and have no idea what's going on. The fact is very few people are invested in this like this, but this is the fabric of reality ultimately and a, a question about how we go about uh, trying to probe whatever's next. Yeah. I think it's amazing. I think it's the most 
significant and intricate and difficult puzzle there is right now for anybody to tackle and to immerse themselves in. And I also think it's potentially incredibly rewarding, but it's also one of the hardest things you can do. It's a, I, yeah. probably the hardest thing has never been harder. Yeah. That's almost as hard as learning to surf. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> you've been through the portal with Garrett Lisi here from the Island of Maui, my arch nemesis. You're welcome to come back anytime. And uh, if you're interested in the Pacific Science Institute, it's Garrett's attempt to try to figure out how to move science outside of uh, direct institutional control. Uh, you can find him on Instagram, I think, as Garrett.Lisi and on Twitter as Garrett Lisi. Garrett Lisi. Not, not hard to find. All right. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Eric. All right. <laughs> Be well. <laughs> <laughs>